Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Something about recording really late in the evening just brings out the either best or worst in us. It's up to the patrons who listen to the bonus episodes to decide that. I'll, I'll throw all of what just happened in there. <laughs> <laughs> but by all rights, all of us should just be like dead tired. I should just be like the grumpiest jerk in the world right now. And instead it's, I don't know. <laughs> it's something. It's, it, it's baby talk and warning signs. Well, baby talk is in like <laughs> not to, not about not to one another. No, <laughs> well, kinda. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, <laughs> we do have to make sure that all of your uh, your sniffling and sneezing is is out of the way. And that's true. Anyways, weird opening, but you know what? It's late. I'm leaving it in. Uh, speaking of people filling their diapers, Jamie Ben <laughs> stole your joke from be before you hit record, Brad. But you know what? And we'll talk about this later. I am pleasantly surprised with how this one turned out and just the amount of people that came out of the woodwork yesterday after Jamie Benn did what he did to Mark Stone to say, oh, yeah, here's a clip of him doing this to my favorite team's player. And there's you can make an hour-long sizzle reel of that. Well, on the plus side, we have longed for hockey to lean more into the entertainment value of things. And here Jamie Benn's leaning into his inner WWE and developing a finishing move. So really, George Peros did another disservice by suspending him. The one time. <laughs> no, that one was bad. Okay, uh, lots to cover today, and we have uh, uh, lots of extra content for you uh, as the prospect profiles roll on, uh, as we bring in uh, more folks to talk about the chaos in the NHL and, and their perspectives on the Red Wings and lots more. Uh, here to talk to you about all of that uh, on the Winged Wheel podcast, I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. Welcome to the show. Uh, as I said, lots to talk about. We're going to start with a conversation about Clayton Keller as uh, news has come out that he's looking for more certainty uh, from Arizona. And because they have a propensity to never have certainty, this is potentially an opportunity for teams looking for a uh, really potent uh, forward to add to their lineup uh, who's under team control or cost control uh, for quite some time ahead. Uh, read the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, we are going to be joined by a good friend of the podcast, Dmitry Filipovich, to give his perspective on the Red Wings season, what's coming up for Steve Eisenman and uh, Hockey Town this offseason, and uh, a look at the NHL playoffs and news uh, across the league. Uh, we have our own uh, conversations about league news, the salary cap potentially going up more than the scheduled million, uh, the goings-on of Jamie Benn, as we alluded to at the top of the show, all of that and uh, a lot more to come. Before that, I want to let you know that this uh, podcast is proudly supported by our Patreon supporters. Everything that we do is uh, is really driven by our patrons. Uh, Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast. If you want to join the uh, Dub Dub Club, as Steve originally named, uh, you get bonus content like our uh, uh, bonus episodes, which record right after these main episodes, where uh, we kind of let loose, have fun. It's either better or worse than the main episodes. It's up to you to decide. Uh, you also get access to our Winged Wheel Podcast official Discord. In addition to that, uh, you are also entered into all of our giveaways automatically. Uh, for example, this past season, we gave away two tickets to every Red Wings home game at the LCA, the vast majority of them going to our Patreon supporters. Again, that's patreon.com slash podcast if you want to join uh, the Dub Dub Club. Clayton Keller is a player who's making $7.15 million a year for the next one, two, three, four, five seasons. Next season, he has no clause that would prevent him from being traded. In 2024-2025, he has a no-trade clause for two seasons, and then the last two years is a full no-move clause. So Clayton Keller is a forward who is potentially available if Arizona can't satisfy his want for certainty, for a little bit of structure, to know where the hell he's going to be playing for the, for the rest of his contract. And you can't, can't blame him for that. Uh, over a point per game player last year, 37 goals, 49 assists for 86 points in a full 82 games, has generally been that uh, um, a really potent winger uh, for his entire career, and he's really kind of emerged uh, over the past couple seasons especially. And that contract control with the, the cap going up is going to be attractive to a lot of teams. So is this a potential huge get via trade for Steve Eisman and the Red Wings? A high-end forward who is playing with pop quiz without looking. Name his two line mates this year. Absolutely, absolutely not. I won't do that. 
Would you even know who they were if I told you? Uh, maybe. But not likely. Sounds like a Detroit Red Wing already. <laughs> uh, no, this one is interesting. And obviously, this is all with the caveat of the big if he becomes available. Because, again, a young, high-powered forward with lots of team control at a reasonable cap, it, they, these do not come available often. And if he is available, half the league will be tripping over themselves to get him. Uh, so the first question, should the Red Wings be interested? And the answer is very obviously yes. He's exactly what they're lacking, a high-end offensive first-line forward who can, you know, play make, set up plays, drive play, score goals. You know, you want him on the power play, sure, 5-5, five and five, effective there. The problem with Clayton Keller is he's a – Forward, who's over a point per game, who makes $7.1 million for five more years under team control. He is going to cost you. Yeah. You are not getting Clayton Keller for the Bruins pick and some scraps. Like, I'm my gut feeling on what Clayton Keller would cost is going to be three premium pieces and one to two secondary pieces. Again, you're probably getting an asset for every year that he's under control. And, you know, because, you know, put a hypothetical, if Clayton Keller was available at the trade deadline as a pending UFA, he's getting a first-round pick as a rental. Yep. You're getting him for five years. Yeah. So the Red Wings should be interested. They're going to have to pony up, and they should. Like, I, I, this is one of those players you should not be afraid of the cost. If you have to give them... You know, the Isles pick this year and both your first round picks next year, you probably do it. That solves a big or it moves the needle in a big way in Detroit's scoring issue. You're going to hear Dimitri reference it in the interview upcoming, but Detroit was among the worst in the league at five on five offense. And this is a guy who changes that. Detroit has weapons emerging. They don't have guys who can break through and do it all on their own, really. From time to time, certain players can make things happen. I can see Lucas Raymond especially emerging to be someone who does that a little bit more. But they don't have a game breaker, so to speak. Clayton Keller isn't that necessarily, but he elevates the players around him. And the way he moves the puck around and finds his teammates is especially noteworthy. Which is why this is a contract that people are looking at. Another player from Arizona that you've referenced, Brad, is Nick Schmaltz and... You know, when that was first brought up to me, I've said this before, I, I kind of scoffed at it. I thought, mm, I'm not sure that he's necessarily worth it. But the more you look into Nick Schmaltz, you're like, I really like this as a potential option for Detroit. Clayton Keller is so good that you would absolutely go balls to the wall to try to get him rather than uh, uh, anyone else that could be offered up. So, yeah, for Detroit, they're not going to have um, a solution coming soon via draft. Uh, they're not going to have a solution coming via unrestricted unrestricted free agency this year. If you can get a Clayton Keller, that is a lot of offense that Derek Lalonde and Steve Eisman both noted that the team needs that comes in in a big way. I can't imagine the cost. Even the cost if, he, if the Red Wings are the only option, the only team he wanted to play for, I think that cost is... Well, I mean, it's going to make you extremely uncomfortable. But the number of teams who will be lining up for Clayton Keller services yeah. will drive that price even higher. It's going to be crazy. And I think you got to know when to fold the cards if it does get too crazy. The benefit here is I would argue that the Coyotes are going to be looking almost entirely for futures here. They don't want anything for the right now because they don't know what the right now is. Yeah, They don't know where it is. So this is a franchise that, whether they want to or not, has to build for the future. So almost every return in a Clayton Keller trade would be futures. There's probably not a team in the entire NHL better positioned to give a huge futures package than the Detroit Red Wings. You know, my hot of hot takes is if you look at all the prospects the Red Wings have, the holes they have in the roster, and, you know, the picks they have, whatever. I would make a pitch for both Schmaltz and Keller. Oh, I, that would be amazing. I, I understand what that would cost. Basically, you take the Red Wings' top 12 prospects, you label them 1 through 12 in order of how good they are until Arizona they can pick the odds or the evens. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But I would do it. 
Like, I would yeah. 100% do that because Schmaltz has three years of term left. Keller's got five. There's two of the holes in your top six filled by, hey, actual good top six <laughs> forwards. Yeah. It, it solves a massive problem. And the Red Wings system is not depleted if they do that. Obviously, it's severely weakened, but you get two top six uh, NHL forwards, one of them a star. So, you know, you might have to lose a Casper or an Edmondson, and you're probably going to lose one of Wallander and Johansson. You're probably losing a couple first-round picks at a minimum. You do it, and you don't think twice. In terms of who's actually a prospect, so don't include Cider or Raymond in this. In terms of actual prospects, I think the only one that I would really feel uncomfortable with is Casper, and not because he's so irreplaceable. Um, and, like, don't get me wrong, like, he is a very, very, very key prospect for this team. But the positional scarcity and the player archetype scarcity of a guy who can, you know, potentially be a top six center and also like crash the net and punch you in the face and and play with some talent too. We, we Detroit's been lacking on that front for so long. I would hesitate to throw that away. And if I could be so selfish as to add one more, I think pick nine this year would be really tough to let go of. But pretty much anything else. Yes, I, I'm with you there. Um... Any player in this organization under the age of, let's say, 24, just because that's what Arizona will be looking for, not named Cider or Raymond, is on the table for me. Casper, I agree, would be the one I would fight to keep. Pick nine, I would argue, is more valuable than Casper at this point. So if push came to shove, I think you'll get a better player at nine this year than Marco Casper. Even though I love Marco Casper, like in, in a perfect world, you keep both. But we've talked about this time and time again. The Red Wings are not in a position to get picky on stuff like this anymore. They can't. No. They just do not have the luxury, you know, thanks to the draft lottery and, and all that fun stuff. They need to find star talent. And it's and we've talked at length. It doesn't come available often. So when it does, you have to make uncomfortable moves to acquire it, whether that is in all likelihood, just one player, but, or if you want to get weird, like I'm suggesting and go for both, yeah, you have to do it. And, you know, are the Red Wings going to lose pieces that are going to make everybody very upset to be losing? Yes. Yeah. You have to, you don't get talent without giving up talent. You know, if the Red Wings have to send Edvinson hypothetically to Arizona to get Clayton Keller. Yeah, that sucks. Cause Simon Edvinson is going to be a really damn good player. But he's not going to be Clayton Keller. He's not going to have a Clayton Keller level impact in all likelihood. And and the Red Wings have a, you know, the world of left defense prospects. So yeah. it, it's going to suck, but it's going to be a huge benefit if they can do it. Yeah, we've talked about this ad nauseum and we'll continue to. Based on the path that the Red Wings took from last offseason, if not two offseasons ago to now, uh, where they chose not to tank for for the Bedard draft, which again, this isn't a, a maligning that decision, but you move in you move in that direction, and then now you have Buffalo and Ottawa kind of outpacing you in terms of the way their rebuilds are going, and and you have to decide where you want to be in the Atlantic. No, you can't create contrived moves or or spend stupidly in terms of your assets and your money, but if you have an opportunity to bring in a a guy who can be effective for you for a long time is cost controlled for a long time it can solve a direct issue of need yet yeah, you've got to start overspending on your assets this is when you have to kind of you know empty your wallet to to get what you want because everyone else is is cutting ahead of you in line uh, Ottawa and Buffalo have had a little bit more luck than you uh, for one reason or another they're the way they're advancing is they have things that Detroit doesn't so Detroit has to decide what they're going to do to kind of catch up to them. And I don't say that lightly. Like, this is a hypothetical that is incredibly unlikely because there are 30 other teams who will be looking at this in one way or another. Um, and it, there's no guarantee that, that Keller even gets traded, but in a hypothetical where he does, this is the exact kind of thing where you have to, if you're the GM of the Red Wings, look at it and say, here's what I'm comfortable with, and here's a little bit more to make sure it happens, and here's a little bit more to make damn sure the deal is closed. Because otherwise, you're going to be wallowing for a long time based on where Detroit is organizationally. They've had no luck, and they've been mired in the kind of shitty tanking scene for too long. I'd, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about this from the non-Detroit angle, because obviously you have to have a willing partner in Arizona. Um, obviously, they have a lot of uncertainty, and if Keller demands a trade, that that's obviously why we're talking about it. But 
Let's not forget, Jacob Chick- Chikrin demanded a trade, and they held on to him for almost two years before they finally folded. Yeah. Um, even though this team has an uncertain future and they don't know what's going on, they still need to ice a team. They still need to have players on the roster. The Arizona Coyotes have three players. Period. Not forwards. <laughs> three players signed beyond this upcoming season. Nick Schmaltz. Clayton Keller and Lawson Krauss. And all of them have conversations around them on whether or not they're going to be there long term. So they have to keep somebody with term around just so they have something to ice. So they may hear the trade request and go, okay, well, tough. Like, yeah. We we don't have an option. We need you here. The NHL might force their hand and go, hey, you're moving to Houston. You can't have Lawson Krauss be your best player when you get there. Yep. You have we have to have somebody to market, somebody to sell, and that's a real thing. I, I know that might be hard to conceptualize, but the commissioner will say you are not going to like the, you were. This isn't not how you're going to handle your team. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of things outside of Detroit that might ever prevent this from coming to fruition for Detroit, and beyond what Arizona might want to do, beyond what Detroit wants to do. Even if Arizona relents and, uh, you know, accommodates a potential trade request, what, conservatively 21, 22 other teams are calling Arizona oh, yeah. for his services? At least. So you have to outbid all of them. 24-year-old point-per-game winger with uh, uh, cost certainty from now until forever? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone is calling. Exactly. So this is a long shot, but this is another good example of why we talk about it constantly. This doesn't happen often. Yep. You are going to have to overpay. You are probably ultimately going to, you know, regret parts of the trade. And that's fine. That is if Simon Edmondson or Marco Casper or whoever, whatever draft pick they give up, one of them turns into a star, maybe not to the level of Clayton Keller, but a really damn good player. Okay, good. Good for Arizona. They're happy. They'll trade with you again, but yeah. you got, but the Red Wings got what they needed. If, if that is the circumstance. And again, people look at trades to black and white. I want to give you everything. I want to take everything. Sorry for nothing. And every player we send you, we want them to fail. That's not That's how I work in fantasy football. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But in the NHL, if you make trades where both parties are happy, teams are then more likely to trade with you because they view you as reasonable, yada, yada, yada. You can go through, you know, business one oh one, but that's ultimately what's going to have to happen for the Red Wings to acquire a major star level piece. I'm sorry. I was going to send us the interview here, but have you seen Arizona's uh, draft board for the next three years? Oh, did they run out of space? <laughs> oh, my God. It is outrageous. They have four second round picks in 2024 and four second round picks in 2025. Four, se- four third round picks in 2023 and three third round picks in 2024. The, the the most amazing part about all that is they only have one second round pick this year and it's their <laughs> own. Yeah, it's it's hard because they're gonna look they, you might try to incentivize them with uh Detroit's two of Detroit's three second round picks, for example, and they're gonna say, Why? We have eight in the next nine in the next three years. We don't need second we need first round picks. Well, you know where one of the most popular uh landing spots for Reinbacher is in the draft? Arizona's first round pick. Ahead of Detroit's. You know why? Arizona doesn't have a lot of defensive prospects in the system. You know what Detroit has a lot of? Defense. Really good defensive prospects in the system. So, again, if he goes to market, Detroit probably is the team that can offer Arizona the best trade package of what they would want. That and maybe you offer to buy them lunch one day. That team always seems hard for hard for cash, so mm-hmm. they'll probably do quite a bit for you. Does uh does Steve have like one of those like Amex black cards that he can get them into like different lounges in the Houston or Salt Lake City area? I I get the impression that they have a pretty good travel rewards card. Yeah, maybe you loan them uh, a Redbird, the the team's private <laughs> plane, Redbird Two, uh, for like you know a week a month. That might do it. Anyhow, uh, I know hypotheticals are are tough to spend a lot of time on, and folks uh, sometimes wonder why because. There's a small chance of anything happening in the NHL because it's the NHL. But I I, want to point back to what Brad said. This is the kind of move, not only that would change things significantly, it's the kind of move that you have to look at because it does not come up often. And Detroit is uniquely positioned 
to actually do the thing here. So uh, one that will monitor uh, if the hockey gods are just Clayton Keller will want out. And uh, this is something that we can uh, uh, look forward to potentially speculating about and definitely not be heartbroken about in the future. Okay, for now, uh, let's jump over to our conversation with Dmitry Filipovich, uh, a good friend of ours. Uh, He does the Hockey PDO cast now with Sportsnet, so uh, always good to catch up with him where he gives us his thoughts on uh, not just the Red Wings season and its players, but also the playoffs and uh, the Arizona arena situation as well. So tune in for that, uh, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Dmitry, it's been a uh, a big summer or spring, I should say, for the NHL, and as someone who covers... Uh, a lot of everything i imagine you've been pretty busy so how have you been uh keeping up man it's been good i this is my first year doing a daily show the podcast uh went over to sports night radio and has been turned into a daily format so it's a it's a bit of a new challenge just trying to come up with new shows every single day as opposed to like once a week or whatever picking my spots here or there but it's been fun the playoffs have kept me busy uh it's been a pretty entertaining postseason so far so there's been a lot to talk about so i'm excited to uh to join you and catch up Folks, this is uh, our good friend of the show, Dmitry Filipovich, obviously host of the Hockey PDO cast, as he just mentioned, uh, and you can also find his work on EP Ringside. So, uh, Dmitry, I've always loved our conversations because you have a really good, unique uh, outside view of what's happening, not just for the Red Wings, but the entire kind of Atlantic Division and Eastern Conference. So uh, let's talk about the Red Wings season. What did you make of, of the kind of roller coaster year that Detroit had, which had everything from uh, battling legitimately for a wild card spot to trying to maximize their draft lottery pick. Yeah, I think it was an interesting season. I mean, I, I believe right before the deadline, I had you and uh, sorry to keep plugging my own show here, but I had you and uh, and our pal Max Boltman on and we had a kind of like a deep dive state of the union sort of deal on the Red Wings. And so I remember at the time expressing my kind of concerns about whether they were putting the cart before the horse a little bit, just in terms of trying to um, start playing kind of like a, like a contender when they weren't actually at that level yet. Right. There's a lot made of how like Derek Lalonde was trying to install this sort of lightning defensive system and structure and skipping the part of the organizational cycle that I think teams need to go through where you have like a year or two where you play really high scoring, fun games. You're very electric offensively with all your young talent, but you're still flawed and you still lose games and and that's okay. That's part of the process. And they seem to be trying to kind of like expedite that by skipping that step almost. And I was a little bit worried about that and all of their underlying numbers reflected it. I think they finished 28th in five on five scoring. I think only the Blackhawks uh, generated fewer five on five expected goals per 60 than in the season. And so um, I was worried about that. And then I really liked what they did at the deadline because I think that showed a clear sense of of self, right? They sort of took a step back, realized where they were at in the league's hierarchy and acted accordingly and made a really smart series of moves, recouped a bunch of financial flexibility and draft capital that they can use, not necessarily on players in the draft, but potentially um, as we were talking about before we went on air, there's going to be a lot of very talented players in that age, 24 to 27 or 28 window that could help this team a lot that might shake free and become available this summer. And so you can always use some of that flexibility and capital to go and steal a couple of those guys. And so all of a sudden now they've opened up a lot of doors to improve their team this summer. And so I liked what they wound up doing. I didn't necessarily like the path to getting there, but I still think it was ultimately the right outcome. So considering their season and, uh, you know, where they landed, obviously they ended up with the ninth best lottery odds, they ended up with the ninth overall pick. They have picks 9 and 17 and a a slew of other picks, especially in the second round this year. This free agency class is a little thin, um, and you mentioned uh, that moves are going to be tougher to make, uh, but they're still available. You know, guys could shake loose via trade or whatever. Do you think there's a big step to be taken this offseason for the Red Wings if you're Steve Eisenman, or do you think it's kind of just stay the course and don't worry too much about what the Ottawa's and the Montreal's and the Buffalo's are doing around you? That's a great question. I mean, if I knew what Steve Eisenman was going to do, I... uh... I mean, I would tell you, of course, but I would also probably be in a, in a, <laughs> I wouldn't be doing, doing podcasts. I'd be, I'd be running the world, right? Um, <laughs> no, I, it's, it's interesting, right? Because I think last summer they were obviously very decisive and aggressive. And I think they wound up coming to regret it a little bit, although a bunch of the signings it did make certainly helped add like a level of competency and professionalism to the team. And that's always good when you have a bunch of young players coming up, but, um, I'm not sure it seemed like based on everything that Steve Eiserman said at the deadline when he made those moves to take, kind of take a step back, he acknowledged that teams like 
the Sabres and the Senators who might be kind of their direct competition as the next wave or next generation of Atlantic Division teams were already ahead of them in their own organizational life cycle. And so I wonder if that's going to make them take a bit more of a patient or or cautious uh, approach this summer. I think it certainly helps. I mean, I would generally say that trying to build your team out through free agency and the unrestricted market is always a losing proposition. And so it might help that there just really aren't like we're seeing Michael Bunting positioned as as one of the top free agents. And so I think that's going to work in their favor in the sense that I think it's it, they're really even if they did want to spend a bunch of money, there just aren't guys available for it. So I think the trade route makes a lot more sense. And then there's a bunch of guys who theoretically could be available that would help this team a lot. And and they certainly do have at least the the picks to entertain that, whereas some other teams that might be interested otherwise simply don't. So um, I think we could see him be a bit more aggressive in the trade route. And I'd be I'd be all for that. Are there any guys that stand out to you, especially considering what you mentioned of Detroit's lack of five on five offense? You know, the, the dream for Red Wings fans right now is talking about Kyle Connor, who's probably the least mm-hmm. likely of the Jets to be traded. But right. are there any guys who kind of stand out to you either most prominently or as a dark horse for Detroit to try to acquire? Yeah, I mean, I would even look at Nick Ehlers um, as his teammate. Obviously, he's under contract for a shorter period of time. So it's it's more of a kind of win now move as opposed to a longer runway for that. But he'd also come with a much cheaper acquisition cost, I imagine. It feels like you probably could be in the market to buy low on him a little bit just because I think of the world of him as a player. I actually think he's a superior all-around player than, than Kyle Connor. The The fact that he hasn't been able to stay healthy the past couple of years is a concern, but it really seems like most of his issues can be pointed back to two coaches in Paul Maurice and Rick Bonus, who, for whatever reason, viewed him as being too risky. So I'm not sure if Derek Lalonde would agree with that as well, but he's a player who would answer a lot of the questions the Red Wings have as a team right now and could be had for a reasonable price. But I don't know. There's guys like him, um, you know, potentially Jesper Bratt after the off, after the postseason he had that was a bit underwhelming, disappointing for New Jersey. They have a bunch of money that they need to spend on guys, including Timo Meyer this summer. So he could potentially be available. Um, I'm I'm all for it. I think if you can infuse this team with like young skill that makes sense with the group they have and isn't necessarily purely a win now move, but helps them long term as well. I think that's the type of move they should be entertaining. And so I'm all for that. Looking at a, a micro level player by player for Detroit, uh, the two kind of most important young guys for the Red Wings right now, uh, or at least last season, were Mo Sider and Lucas Raymond. And it was kind of a tale of two tapes for them. Um, they both had their ups and downs. I think Sider turned it around it and had a much better season as he kind of found his form again. And Raymond was uh, was a lot of hot and cold. You know, you saw the talent that made him potentially a future star, but also a lot of kind of deficiencies that. Uh, hampered him into taking the step that I think he wanted to this year. What do you think of uh, their seasons, especially in, in terms of what you want to see from Lucas Raymond moving forward? Yeah, well, let's start with Sider. I thought it, it, it was very notable that he started the year right playing with Ben Chirot. All of his underlying numbers took a massive dip. Uh, shockingly so, couldn't have seen that coming. And then once he started playing with uh, with a favorite of, of ours, Jake Wallman, skyrocketed completely, and it made a lot more sense stylistically. I think you actually saw... Um, it just helped Mo Sider a lot in terms of utilizing his skating. It's not necessarily something we think about, but Wallman's ability to make plays with the puck on the breakout helped Mo Sider play off the puck a little more, right? He was able to sort of skate in as a trailer sometimes, be able to jump in without necessarily having to carry the puck or break it out himself. And so it made sense that that pairing worked so well together and, and is very encouraging in terms of what the future is going to look like. So I know people were a bit worried about Mo Sider at the start of the year. I'm not sure, Ryan, if uh, if Wings fans in particular were. Um, but I, I just know like people around the league were like, oh, it's kind of weird that he's not playing as well as he did last year because people just expect young players to get better and better every single season and not necessarily realizing that it's not always that linear of a progression. Um, but based on what we saw from him in the final, whatever, 30 or so games, I uh, I would still expect uh, like the sky is the limit for him moving forward. In Eisenman's postseason press conference, he cited the need for this team to improve internally uh, coming into next season. Uh, obviously, he sees, and Derek Lalone mentioned the same thing, that they rounded out the defensive game really well, but uh, the goal scoring just isn't there. And he wants, they both want to see more from Lucas Raymond. They both want to see more from Joe Valeno. Is that a fair statement to say? Like, is that kind of internal expectation uh, of growth uh, the way to improve to make yourself more legitimate as a wildcard contender? 
Yeah, I think it's fair, especially with the ages of some of those guys. I'd also include like a Bergeron in that in that list as well, right? Of guys that um, have problem solving capabilities as players that can kind of help the Red Wings break into some of these tougher areas in the offensive zone and create more high quality looks, right? Because that's what this boils down to. We're seeing this postseason in particular. I know, like, if you're not cheering for any of these teams watching and you cheer for someone else, you can sort of make take find takeaways, I guess, from what works and what does in the postseason and try to apply it to your team in terms of team building. We're seeing that being able to create in different ways, whether it's off the rush or leveraging your forecheck into creating opportunities off turnovers or uh, working the puck down low behind the net and then popping up into the slot and getting high danger looks from that inner slot area. These are all like you have to be able to attack in different ways and, and problem solve to getting there. And so these young players they have that they've drafted and they're trying to develop is going to be the key to that, right? I don't think there's necessarily going to be one move or two moves where you go out and you trade for someone or you sign someone and all of a sudden that's going to solve everything. Like to reach this ultimate destination that they want to get to, it's going to involve a lot of development of some of these young players. So I wouldn't necessarily put it all just on that. It's going to be a combination of those things, certainly, and just infusing more talent into the lineup. But you do have to start with having high expectations for the young players who are already in place. And more on young players. Uh, Marco Casper is expected to fight for a roster spot as well as Simon mm -hmm. Edvinson. Uh, Casper got his game. Simon Edvinson got nine at the end of the last season. Uh, imagining a world where Casper can come in and, and make a decent impact, likewise with Edvinson. Uh, I don't know that we're going to see any of the picks from this year. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine a ninth overall pick coming in uh, and making the team. So just counting those guys and whatever moves within reason that could happen in terms of trades or signing in the offseason, what do you think is a most realistic outcome for the Red Wings next season in terms of overall standing? That's a good question. Um, well, just predict the future, Dimitri, if you could. Yeah, no, no. Um, I mean, I would have said heading into this season, I was like, oh, maybe this is finally the year the, the Bruins take a step back. Now next year it might actually finally be based on some of the, the financial kind of uh, constraints that they're going to face and some of the looming uncertainty on, on players like Bergeron. I still think it would be unreasonable to expect them to go from the best regular season team in NHL history to not being one of the playoff teams coming out of the Atlantic. So if you're still counting the Leafs, the Lightning, the Bruins there, and then I... I'm wearing my, uh, I was going to wear my wing wheel podcast t-shirt today. I couldn't find it in preparation for the show. So I put on my, uh, Tage Thompson tee here. Um, <laughs> as people who follow me know, I'm very high on the Sabres team moving forward. They kind of, I wouldn't necessarily even view them as direct competition with the Red Wings right now, because I feel like they already showed that at least offensively, they're a step ahead at this point. Um, so I would put the Sabres up there as well. And then you get into the Ottawa and Detroit, I still think Montreal is going to play the long game here and they're not necessarily in a rush. So it's going to be difficult to crack into the, that top four, certainly in Atlantic. I think the fifth is up for debate. And I'm kind of curious to see what Ottawa does with uh, the resolution of their ownership and then what they decide to do this summer in terms of building out their team. Um, so I think anywhere in that kind of fifth to sixth place in Atlantic is should be the goal now that's going to make it tough to to make the playoffs because the Metro themselves are obviously very competitive as well. But I don't know. I, I, I get the frustration and the angst in terms of like, I'm sure you yourself doing the show are sick of viewing draft season as, as your Super Bowl, right? It's like, I want to get into actually playing meaningful playoff games and, and cheering for that and talking about that and breaking that down as opposed to doing scouting reports on who the ninth to 12th best prospects are. Um, so I get that, but it does it's a process. You can't just necessarily push a bunch of chips into the middle of the table and be like, well, just because I want it to be this way, we're going to be a playoff team. That's not necessarily how it works. And that also really limits uh, your ability to actually do more than just that and potentially win a Stanley Cup in future years. So you do have to take a very patient approach here, as frustrating as it is after all these years. Uh, truth, the truth uh, hurts, Dimitri. Didn't ask for that, so appreciate it. Someone <laughs> laughed at us. A good friend of mine was like, uh, you know how funny it is that every time you advertise your draft lottery live stream, you call it an annual draft lottery live stream? I was like, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> how many, was it, it the, like the, the sixth annual now or whatever? How long? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's for my mental health that I don't count anymore. I just hope yeah. we don't hit a tenth. If we have to do a decade celebration, that's bad. Uh, you, you mentioned the playoffs, so let's jump over to that. Um, just for context for folks, we are recording this um, late afternoon on May 24th, so before the Hurricanes-Panthers Game 4 has started. So at the time of recording, both the Knights and Stars and the Hurricanes and Panthers series are at 3 nothing. Both conference finals could potentially end up in a sweep. 
Walk us through what's happened in these playoffs because it seems to be, and I know we say this every year, but an especially wild one where no one can kind of predict the way this is going to shake out. Yeah, certainly. And round two was all about the blowouts, right? It, there were some some longer series played out, but every game seemed to be some sort of a 4 nothing, 5-1 type of scoreline. And we were all like, can we please get some competitive, dramatic games? And we've gotten that here in the conference final, right? I think the game three last night between the Stars and the Golden Knights was the first game so far in the conference finals that had a multi-goal lead at previously. Every single game had been a one-goal game throughout. And so that's very exciting. But now we're facing down two potential sweeps of both series at three nothing. So that's clearly not ideal from a from a drama perspective. Um I don't know. Do you want to do the do you want to do the East first or do you want to talk about the West series? Let's talk about the West just because okay. we we had the Jamie Ben and uh that whole blowout last night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's both uh, the first two games went to overtime, were super close, basically coin flips. Game three obviously got away from Dallas very quickly um, and was about as big of a debacle as you can have given the circumstances coming home, trying to get back, trying to counterpunch in that series and just having it get away from you the way that it did. Um, Vegas has just been the better team. Like they've dominated in the neutral zone in that series. Um, their depth scoring has come through. They just have so many more ways that they've shown that they can beat you compared to this Dallas team, which has. You know, in the first two rounds, we were talking about how, okay, adding Max Domi and Evgeny Dodonov has improved their depth scoring, and all of that has dried up, and they're basically reverted back to being sort of a one-line team, whereas Vegas is spreading the wealth, and basically all of their top top three lines could be a top line for most other teams. So I've been really impressed with Vegas. I I, I picked Edmonton, admittedly, in round two. And uh, and was disappointed by that result because it made me look kind of stupid. And then in round, heading into round three, I sort of forgot all the lessons that I'd learned from that series and was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the Stars team. I could see them winning this and now quickly coming to regret that as well. So Vegas has been the team so far that that has really kind of shown that the playoffs can be unpredictable. That's a charitable interpretation of it. The other one is that I just have no idea what I'm talking about. Well, welcome to the club. It's uh, if I had to feel bad every time I got something wrong, I would be sad all the time. So uh, I, I don't hold myself to that standard. But in the East, you have Florida, who's been the, the king slayer and taking down Boston, um, maybe even the same thing and taking down the, the, mm-hmm. the Leafs, who seemingly were on cloud nine. And now we're up three nothing on a very uh, a Carolina Hurricanes team that seemed to be better as the playoffs gone on. So can you count against their ability to disrupt and, you know, for Bob to kind of goalie you every game at this point? Well, I would include um, the Leafs in that description of incl- what you described for Boston as well, because I believe after round one, the Leafs were the betting favorite to win the Stanley Cup at that point in time. And then the Panthers beat them in five. Um, I just did a show on this the other day, kind of looking at obviously Bobrovsky has been outrageously good right he has like a 978 save percentage through these three games uh ever since the leaf series started really he's basically been limiting teams to one or two goals and then shutting the door so he's been phenomenal especially based on our expectations heading in where he wasn't even playing it was alex lyon that was playing ahead of him in the first three games but defensively i think they've actually done a really good job in front of him of limiting the types of chances they're giving up allowing him to just focus on basically having a one-on-one against the shooter and so I've seen a lot of the stats of his like goal save above expected, which are just at a historically high rate right now. I don't think those are accurate, especially based on the public models. I think they're overinflated a little bit. He's still been obviously very good, Um, but this is more of a team effort. Like I, I, that's the point I guess I'm trying to make here in, in terms of when you look at their success, they've done a lot of good things right beyond just their goalie stopping everything. And it seems like a lot of the coverage of them has been just that in the series. So, with the series where they're at right now, who is your pick for the cup? You get to cheat. You get to pick with all the knowledge you have now. Who do you uh, have taking it all? I guess you would have to go. I, I would have to go with the Golden Knights at this point. Um, I just think if we're looking at a potential Golden Knights versus Panthers series in the Stanley Cup final, um, it's going to be a very high paced series, very high event. It's going to be fun to watch. I just think this Vegas team um, has shown that they just have more. Uh, more ways they can beat you, more depth. And regardless of what type of game is played, I think that they are very comfortable doing so. And so in a series against Florida, I just feel like they're going to be able to solve them a bit more than than the alternative. All right. And, and on the theme of uh, league chaos, obviously we all know what's been going on with Arizona. Uh, the Tempe uh, deal was shot down. Um, 
the account seems to be memeing themselves to the grave. <laughs> uh, there's no kind of solid option as to what's going to happen next. The NHL and Arizona have both taken the line, and we're going to try to find something that works in the desert. Uh, but what do you make of what's next for them? Is it relocation? If so, where? Or do you think that there's going to be a concerted effort to just try to revive another arena deal here somehow? Yeah, that's a great question. It seems like at least for this year, the most likely outcome is they'll probably play in Mullet Arena again, and then this will be something that they get solved for the following season. But now that you mention it, we probably should have included a guy like Clayton Keller in the conversation of realistic mm -hmm. trade targets that if they're available, the Red Wings should really be prioritizing and being all over, both from a, a contract term perspective where he has a bunch of years left on his deal to the age, to the actual skill set. Like he's a player where I would be willing to package all sorts of draft capital, which I assume if he, I, I believe it's been reported he's given Arizona like a month to basically give him an update on both on and off the ice, what next year is going to look like before he decides what he wants uh, in terms of a trade request. If he's unsatisfied with that answer and makes it known that he wants to be moved, that's a player that I think Detroit should be all over and like they need to. They need to do everything they possibly can to establish themselves as a front runner for his services. All right, Dimitri, appreciate you coming on the show and, and covering such a breadth of topics. Uh, tell us where we can uh, listen to your work, read your work, and uh, find you on Twitter. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Dim Filipovich. Uh, you can subscribe to the Hockey PDO cast wherever you listen to this fine show. Um, and we, if you like to listen on radio, we are on Sportsnet 650, uh, 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific time every single weekday. And then the show goes on the podcast feeds as usual. So, um, yeah, that's about all I got to plug. Ryan, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on. This is always a blast. It's always fun to catch up with you. Yeah, absolutely. Can't wait to do it next time. Talk soon, man. Cheers. Welcome back. Uh, great to have Dimitri on the show. Always appreciate having him on uh, and getting his uh, kind of uh, league-wide and outside perspective on what's happening with the Red Wings, uh, both this past season and upcoming. All right, let's jump into our next prospect profile here as we uh, trundle along towards the NHL draft. And as we alluded to last episode, these are going to get a little bit more significant in terms of uh, the likelihood that the player could be a potential Red Wings draft pick, how high up they are on the board, and this is arguably one of the biggest names where if uh, they are there for Detroit at ninth overall, it might be a run to the podium kind of situation. Not everyone feels that way, but uh, I think internally in the NHL, this player is very, very high on a lot of lists. So Dalibor Dvorsky, where are you at on him? Top 10 for sure. Uh, big Dalibor Dvorsky guy. Um, a guy who's got kind of labeled as, you know, that, that 200 foot center that teams covet. But a lot of misnomers in the draft that often get brought up are if a guy is labeled as, you know, he's a good 200-foot player. It's, yeah, okay, his offense is okay, but his defense is really good to make up for it. And that's not the case for Dvorsky. His offense is legit. This is a guy who's got a ton of skill, a ton of creativity, drives play. Um, his stats this year in Sweden, um, in the J20, were great. In the Alston's gone, they left a little to be desired, and... There were points throughout the season where, you know, people were watching him and wondering, is this it? And then he went to the U18s and, you know, played with a bunch of nobodies. Sorry, Slovakia, but played with a bunch of nobodies in Slovakia and dragged them into the bronze medal game. There was like some absurd stat where he was in on like 90% of the uh, of Slovakia's goals in the medal round or something crazy like that. I, f I forget the exact number, but, you know. Yeah, I said I wasn't going to make the joke, but he's there carrying a bunch of nobodies. He sounds like a Detroit Red Wing already. So I like the player. My question with him is kind of in the same vein as an Oliver Moore that we had, where I know I like the player. I know the player's floor is really high. I know I like the player's talent. But what is that ceiling? If you think the offense is, like, legit, well, couple that with the rest of his game. He's, oh, no doubt, no brainer, slam dunk pick if he even makes it to the Red Wings. Most projections uh, don't have him getting that far in the draft at this point. So it could be a little bit of wishful thinking. I do believe in the offense. I do believe in his 200 foot game and I do believe in his skill. So uh, I, I'm not, 
I haven't settled on who my preferred pick is going to be for Detroit, who's available, but he is going to be very high on that list. So he's going to be one of those players that, you know, continues to grow exponentially, you know, over the next little bit of the year because there's players in this draft who are much older than him, some extremely late birthdays who have, you know, started to tap into their potential a little bit more than him. Um, and he's a big kid too. Like he's over 200 pounds, over six feet. Like he's a lot of GMs and scouts dream. He, um, like Brad alluded to, he's good in all three zones and not just like, because he's not very offensive. He's, he has creativity on the offensive end and he's responsible at all ends of the ice. So there's going to be teams that are, uh, are sprinting up to the draft board or, uh, the podium for him. Um, his foot speed is leaves a little bit to be desired, but um, there's no reason a guy uh, of his sort of build can't add that. And I don't think that's something that's impossible. It's not like we're teaching him, ho- trying to in- invoke some hockey IQ that just isn't there. I, I think, you know, with a good, proper skating coach, he can pick that speed up. So it really depends. It's do you go with the guy who is a bona fide NHLer, or do you bank on someone who could be a superstar? That's really what it boils down to for me. Um, I'm not entirely sure where I land on the Dvorsky um, profile. I like his game a lot, but I always go back to the, do you take a guy who's going to be top to middle six, or do you swing for a guy who could potentially be a superstar? Well, to to make it not a player comparison stylistically necessarily, but when I look at players like Dvorsky who come from like the the lesser countries, um, and you look at their profile with a little bit of you know not poor skating, his skating's good, but like not you know the elite foot speed, but the good two hundred foot game, and you you look at him and you go, can you have like a superstar? And I know this was almost eighteen years ago now, but to me, I, I get a lot of Andre Kopitar vibes. Salt. Just like that'd that, be okay. I'm I'm not saying that's what he is going to be, but Kopitar went outside of the top ten uh for a lot of the reasons why we're questioning Dvorsky right now. And not that we're questioning him, we're actually praising him way more than anything else. Uh but there is a reality here where he he turns into a star. Like you're not just getting a really good player at nine. Like the the ceiling on Dvorsky is there. Yeah. It, it it's very much in the range. So you know, and again, when we talk about this and we talk about prospect ceilings, uh, it's always the caveat that ninety percent of the time they don't hit the ceiling. Sure, they get close to it, but like the ceiling's rare. But it's it's there. I I I'm happy you said that, Brad, because I know initially when you were talking about him just now, you said you were questioning what his true ceiling is, and I I have that same thought, but it's not that I don't think that, or I think I'm worried about his offensive ability. His intelligence and his ability to make plays and his ability to shoot in the offensive zone, we've seen all of those things in spades, and especially at the U18s, I think he did a lot to dispel a lot of fears in, in folks' minds. Uh, I know uh, some people think that he already has started the process of uh, improving his skating, and so they, they're not so worried about that. I believe it was Scott Wheeler who said that in his latest uh, uh, review of Dvorsky. It's what you just said, though. It's the the likelihood of him hitting his ceiling. It's not what his ceiling is for me. It's the likelihood of hitting it. And it's if he didn't have such strong peers around him in the draft, it would be an automatic you run to the, the podium for this guy at nine. I agree with everything you guys said in terms of the kind of game that he brings. Uh, but, you know, a Dvorsky versus a Leonard, a Dvorsky versus Perot, a Dvorsky versus, you know, maybe someone drops really far. That's going to be tough. If you're sold on Dvorsky staying as a center, I think that makes the decision for you in a lot of ways. Like Dvorsky is a certain center. I think I'm there over Oliver Moore. And if you're also certain that Dvorsky is going to be a, a, an everyday center in the NHL, then he's not making it to ninth, plain and simple. That's the most likely scenario here based on, like I said, everything that's been mocked, projected, the the rumblings around the league. is he He's not. I've seen him as high as five. And it, this, here's the thing. Say he doesn't stick at center, but he's still an effective player. This is a highly intelligent uh, or highly effective player in the offensive zone who's responsible at 200 feet already. 
uh, like you said, still has a lot of room to grow, but has shown the way he's able to make the difference on a team, uh, especially without a lot of talent around him. He's not going to be a day one NHLer. He's probably going to need some time to to kind of come into his own, make the league, realize his potential, but the potential is there. And, you know, I understand that wingers are not as uh, perceived as valuable as center, but this is a guy who can really make a difference on Detroit's offense. So I I wasn't certain on Dvorsky for a while, and I, I said to you before we hit record here, I think I'm I'm fully sold on him, that if he's there, he is easily one of my favorite picks for Detroit. There's risk. There is risk there, but the reward is really high. So it ultimately comes down to what your scouting team is telling you about the certainty of this happening. If they don't go with him because they take Ryan Leonard, though, or, or someone else, like that's the beauty of this draft. There's so many great directions that you can go. Uh, it makes it – I mean, I don't envy the draft team's jobs here because there's a lot of uh, probably red herrings out there uh, drawing your attention away from the, the golden goose or whatever. But, you know – there's you, you really can't be mad at a lot of the different options that might be in and around Dvorsky too. Yeah, and I think we I said it last episode, and it's going to be a theme right up until the draft when you look at the players who are going to be available around the Red Wings pick at nine. Obviously, 17 is a whole another category, but it still applies. You know, this is very much a what's your flavor draft because the players in that range, Dvorsky, Leonard, uh, Zach Benson, Gabe Perot, uh, Oliver Moore, they are very different players from each other. So yes. it's not like you're you're picking between, you know, the the two steady defensemen and the two small, highly skilled wingers. Like you've got the speedy center, you've got the smart center, you've got the physical, talented winger, you've got the smart offense smartest offensive player in the draft, possibly, but with who's slow. Like it's it's super super fascinating. This pick might actually give a really good window into what the Red Wings are trying to do long term because yeah, it'll give a pretty indication, pretty good indication of what type of player they they truly covet because they can have just about whatever type they want. Yeah, I think this draft, especially for this pick, is really gonna the the draft interviews will put heavy stock into oh, who they take. Do, do you oh, smoke God. dope, kid? <laughs> I just think like they're going to be able to drill down in their personalities because, you know, we see these players dominate the leagues they play in and they bring this elite talent. But, you know, once you get them in a room and you can really dig into their personalities and their lives, I think that's going to separate a lot of these prospects from one another, at least in the the scouting team and the, the organization's mind. See, what you said made a lot of sense, Evan, but uh, all I'm thinking about is the last time Detroit drafted ninth overall and they picked a player based on how he interviewed <laughs> and his character. Hey, hey, we love him now. We, we love we, Michael Rasmussen now. But You know who else I would love? Marty Nietzsche. Anyway, let's jump into... That's our uh, uh, prospect profile on Dalibor Dvorsky. And again, as most players will be now that we're covering from uh, now until a month from now, is there are going to be players that we're going to be revisiting quite a bit. Uh and we're going to be talking about his peers a lot more uh, as well. So uh, thanks for tuning into that. Uh, let's jump into some NHL news. Jamie Ben is Jamie Ben, and uh, decided to, after you know he got tangled up with Mark Stone, Mark Stone ended up on his back on the ice, was in a vulnerable position. Jamie Ben took his stick and cross-checked Mark Stone in the jaw. It, I think it was where his stick ended up. Uh, you know, forceful downwards cross-check. We've never seen Jamie Ben do that before. Oh, right, when he, I think, literally broke Dylan Larkin's neck, if not uh, severely injured it, causing Larkin to miss the entire end, or the rest of the 2021 uh, end of the season and his entire offseason as he was recovering and hospitalized. And, of course, Jimmy Ben, ben got the uh, very fair punishment in the NHL's eyes of no penalty, uh, no, no review from the Department of Player Safety. So uh, Red Wings fans were very familiar with what happened. Anyhow. He also did it to an Ottawa senator. Yeah, and umpteen other people, too, I'm sure. Yeah, like I said, it's a signature move. So Mark Stone gets a cross-check to the face. Jamie Benn, very early in the game, gets a five-minute major in a game. Great call, obvious call by the refs. Uh, And the Dallas Stars game unravels. They go down. I think one goal was scored on that power play to make it 2-0. They ended up losing the game 4-0 and go down 3-0 in the series. So great captain material from Jamie Benn. And then Jamie Benn goes uh, and doesn't do any media uh, as a good captain does and leaves his teammates to cover for him. Uh, I know, you know, in the world of media, once you have a really big audience, it's 
you're not really meant to just dig into guys like this, but you know, Jamie Ben has just been such a monumental like jerk on the ice and now off the ice. Like, I, I just have no time for someone who is so openly trying to hurt his opponents. Like just so done with it. So, like we said at the top of the show, not surprised to see the outpouring of hatred for Jamie Ben and what he did. Oh no, it's it's very welcoming because I didn't want Jamie Ben to get the Shane Doan treatment. And Red Wings fans will be acutely aware of what I'm talking about before I even explain it. But if you don't understand it, Jamie Ben had this good old Canadian boy, you know, hardworking leader in the NHL, and you know, Ottawa fans, Red Wings fans, and a couple other fan bases knew what a shit heel he is, mm-hmm. and. You know, there was a few fan bases who were not surprised in the least by what he did to Mark Stone. But what happened is on such a prominent stage in the conference finals, the entire hockey world noticed. They saw the cross check. They saw him skipping his post-game availability and letting his teammates twist in the wind for him. They saw that unbelievably stupid lame-ass excuse he presented today. The hockey world knows it. Shane Doan used to be the same player back in the day, but he never did anything like this on the the stage that Jamie Benn just did. So Shane Doan still has this reputation. Jamie Benn just annihilated his. So sometimes, some in these few fleeting moments, the world is just. And Jamie Benn is getting his. The Department of Player Safety, uh, I was pretty surprised. I was honestly expecting them to give him one game, which I would have begrudgingly accepted. Uh, not that I think it would have been fair, but based on what they gave uh, Petrangelo for his slash on dry saddle, I thought, well, that's the standard they're they're giving for and trying to intentionally hurt a guy. So uh, they'll give him one, and they'll see the five-minute major in a game, and that was virtually all of that game, uh, game three, and they'll say, well, that's effectively a, a game in and of itself. So one more is appropriate. And they gave him two games, two playoff games. In addition to Wait, the one. I thought if I thought if they get eliminated and he has one outstanding suspension, it carries over to the next year. Oh, it does. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. You said playoff games. Yeah, well, so he got this. If you want to look at it just for some fancy phrasing and to make it sound better than it actually is, you can say he got the rest of this year and the start of next year. <laughs> Suspended for the remainder of the playoffs. I uh I don't I'm not necessarily rooting against the stars. Uh, but for this, I do hope that they get swept and he has to miss the opener. Well, you've, because, you're doing a great job for you then. <laughs> it's the, But that's the way the NHL Department of Player Safety calculates suspensions. They value playoff games more highly than regular season games, which I do agree with inherently, uh, not to the severity that they do. But two games, do I think it's enough objectively based on his history and what he's done? No, but I also don't think the Department of Player Safety is nearly as as harsh as they need to be on serious infractions like this ever so yeah i'm pleasantly surprised with two games yeah and it's two conference finals games which is one conference nothing. finals game. thank you one, thanks for, for believing yeah thank you i i literally missed my own joke from earlier um <laughs> what time is it by the way anyways too late yeah <laughs> um no i'm i'm actually if it was a regular season game i would have been pushing for a lot more than this but i I understand the weight that playoff games carry versus regular season games, and I understand that gets amplified round by round, so I'm I'm okay with two. The Vegas Golden Knights were in so many people's bad books not very long ago based on their, their treatment of uh, players and personnel and just the reputation around the league and their annoying social media, blah, blah, blah. And it's so funny how that's kind of all been washed away. Uh, and and plays like this from Jamie Ben really go a long way into bringing a lot of people into the I want the Golden Knights to win the Cup camp and it's a it's a bigger tent every day. So funny how reputations change like that in the NHL. Well, speaking of reputations, you see the We Like Ike movement that's going on right now. Jack Eichel, outside of Sergey Bobrovsky, the current NHL Golden Boy. The, no pun intended. The NHL and NHL fandom is, and I think this is all of sports fandom, but so heavily affected by recency. And bias. winning, and winning, yeah. But a guy who's had major, almost unheard of surgery, like give him a second to get his feet back no. under him. He just, well, I mean, it's so funny how this comes around. It's, it's, I mean, it's not the same, but it, it reminds me of the fire Lindy, like one game into the season because the Devils were losing to the Red Wings, which <laughs> a little rude. But I've had a hangnail for like three days, and I'm wondering if that's why I suck at golf. What does that have to do with anything, Evan? Well, Jack Eichel's had oh. neck surgery, so. 
That's probably why he's not that good or wasn't that good. Can everyone listening tell Evan had a bad round today? (laughs) Yeah, it could have been better for sure. Anyways, continue. Sorry. I just thought of that. I thought it would be funny. Anyhow, you're, you know, you're right. You are a funny guy. I'll give you that. Oh man. That's, that's what's going on with uh, Jamie Ben and the stars. So they're going to have a hard time without him. Uh, Although he did kind of ruin game three for, for the stars. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, as we're recording right now, we're not going to comment on the way game four is going in the Florida Carolina series. Uh, Florida's up three, two over Carolina halfway or with five minutes left in the second, but uh, we're not going to try to guess the way that one's going to end. So next episode, we'll have more news on the conference finals. No, well, I'm going to guess how this ends. Okay. I'm going to go way off script here. Carolina gets a ton of shots. Bobrovsky stands on his head. The game finishes three, two. Yeah. You can just use that script four times. Yeah, exactly. I just like, hold on. If the score changes like four three or whatever, just like bleep out where I say the score and just input it there, and the same storyline applies. No overtime, eh? Well, six overtimes this time. Well, that would imply Carolina scoring another goal and scoring True. more than two on uh, Bobrovsky right now seems like a monumental task. You're not I'm, wrong. I'm kind of shocked to even see two on the board. Yeah, honestly. Uh, some other minor NHL news before we get to overtime. Uh, there are conversations and rumblings around the league of uh, increasing the amount the salary cap is going to go up more than the baseline $1 million. Uh, I think there's pressure from both sides to do this. Uh, uh, our favorite chatty agent has suggested as such that ownership is uh, is pushing on the league to increase the salary cap by you know, maybe one and a half or two million dollars, which isn't a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, will help quite a few teams get out of some binds without asking the players to uh, recalculate or give more into uh, escrow. So uh, we'll explain what all that is maybe on a future larger conversations. But essentially, uh, if the league wants the or if the players want the cap to go up by a significant amount now before they pay back the owners what they owe from you know the pandemic prepayments, we call them. The league, the league's stance is that, well, they have to pay more into escrow. Uh, and the player said, no, absolutely not. Uh, and so the league said, well, we're only going up by the scheduled $1 million then. And the owners are now saying, hey, our teams are hurting. We want one and a half or $2 million. We can make that work without asking for more from the players. So uh, I think the Walsh, the NHLPA, uh, the new head of the NHLPA, will probably stand his ground on this one. Um, so we'll see if the league does it. And I will hazard a guess. Uh, I will, sorry, go so far as to say it is in the Red Wings' best interest that this doesn't happen, right? Right now, they're not even at the cap floor, and they have no significant contracts to sign for this upcoming season. They're nearly $9 million under the cap floor. They have project as per cap friendly uh, over thirty point five, over uh, $30.6 million in cap space. Thirty point six, and let's not forget Raymond and Sider's extensions don't kick in whenever they're signed for a whole nother year. Robert Hag, you want seven million dollars? <laughs> like the Red Wings have to sign players; they have to make moves. They literally are against the CBA rules right now because they do not have enough against the cap. Now, you'd be amazed how quickly the small contracts add up. So I'm not going to sit here and say the Red Wings are in danger of not getting to the cap floor. They will literally trip and fall above it. But, but. Did I read a thing today that said only Vancouver is above the salary cap right now? I I didn't read into it. I was looking at the cap floor today because that was more relevant to us. I didn't really do much research into the top end of it. Not a good look for Vancouver if they are over that. They, They were the only team, though, for sure. Yeah, they're... They're six hundred and seventy thousand ish above the uh, the cap currently. Jesus, wow. what you're allowed to do in the off season, but yeah, but I mean, hey, you can go over the cap if it gets you a cup, right? Uh, conference finals, second round, playoff series. Yeah, uh, that's like uh, that's similar to like let's say Ottawa was that much over the cap right now. Jesus. Although I do think I would rather be Ottawa than Vancouver right now. So. Yeah, if the Red Wings are going to be weaponizing their cap space, then they want as many teams uh, squeezed as possible. That's what's important to to kind of use that as another asset. We always refer to assets as draft picks, players, prospects, but cap space is one of them. The cap is going to start going up dramatically in the coming years. We know this. The players are going to catch up on what they owe the league. The league is probably going to expand 18 more teams and just generate a shit ton more money. The dollars are going to flow in even more so, and, and the cap is going to go up. There are certain things that can reduce maybe the ambitious notions of how much the cap's going to go up, but it's been slow and plateaued for so long because of COVID 
uh, in an anticipation of a new TV deal that like it's like a wind up car right now. It's going to go flying away soon. And so the amount of time that you have to weaponize that cap space is dwindling. And this might be the last off season really where the Red Wings can do so in a big way. And everything ties back into this conversation. Detroit didn't get the lottery luck. They've made the most of their draft picks, but you know they don't have a game breaker. They have to try to be a team like Carolina or Seattle if they want to be competitive, but they still have a long way to go to be that. How do you make a move to kind of catch up to the teams around you? You utilize your assets and cap space is another one of the ways you can do that. Yeah, it's actually probably my only, I won't call it major, but legitimate criticism of the Eisenman era so far is that he actually has not weaponized his cap space nearly as much as he probably should have. He was got a fourth round pick to be a middleman on a trade, and he got a second round pick to take on Mark Stahl, and that's it. And there were many, many, many more opportunities to get some assets to do so. So we'll see what can happen this off season. I mean, I'm calling Vancouver every day. Oh yeah. So is everybody else. We'll see what comes of that. Okay, uh, we're going to jump into overtime here on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Uh, Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. If you want to support the show, the bonus episodes, the discord, the giveaways, uh, those are the things that you get access to and lots, lots more. And what you help us do is uh, our support of the Jamie Daniels Foundation and their fight against substance use disorder uh, are the expansion of the winged wheel podcast into the, you know, kind of expanded content universe expected by whom is a new show that we launch hosted by Sean Shapiro and Prashant Iyer, an amazing show that you should uh, check out. They release episodes every Friday uh, and uh, everything that we do, you know, the, the running and the improvement and the expansion of this show itself. So uh, thank you to our patrons, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. Let's take some questions from them. This from new patron. Thank you so much for joining the dub dub club. The jacked scientist says, Hey lads, new to Patreon. And I figured uh, I'd try asking you a question. Was wondering if there's an organization you guys just don't gel with in the NHL. I've never been able to bring myself to root for the stars, not in a hateful way, but more like I can't bring myself to care way. Love the pod. Oh man. Well, the real answer here is probably a team that I'm forgetting. <laughs> yeah. In like a hateful way, it's like Chicago. Oh yeah. There's, there's lots of teams in a hateful way, but if we're just, you know, the team that's just kind of there that whatever I got, I got to actually run through the teams in my head and see which team surprises me that they're, it sounds mean. I don't know, man. I just have never been able to believe in Columbus as a team. Yeah, but that's like a really common set. They are the, such an irrelevant team because it makes them relevant because everybody calls them irrelevant. You know how it was like everybody was calling Barkov underrated for so long that how could you possibly be underrated? Everybody's yeah. talking about you. But I've never seriously looked at Columbus as like, I could envision this team being a threat or a solid hockey team. And I know they have been at times, but Arizona is the other obvious answer. But yeah, Columbus, man, I don't know. They've always just seen like a, if you were to blindly, like let's say you don't watch hockey for 10 years and then you try to predict the standings on the 11th year, you'd probably put Columbus near the bottom. That's Good how chance. I feel about them. I got my answer. I had to run through all the teams, and then as soon as I saw, said the team name, it hit me. It's Minnesota. Oh, interesting. They that are, was going to be one of mine, too. Yeah, they are, they're just there. The definition of the mushy middle, even in the years where they look good, it just ends in a first-round exit that nobody even noticed happened. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, like... I don't know if I remember a single memorable Minnesota Wild moment like outside of anything that's happened in the last two months. Okay. Unless you go back to them ending Patrick Waugh's career. I'll always thank him for that. Minnesota for you too? I was going to say Winnipeg, other than that everyone's trying to go to their garage sale right now. Well, Winnipeg feels kind of that way with how they were threatening their their fans with the, season tickets. The only interesting things that they do are off-ice activities. Yeah. Ah, man, that team's personality, like the good parts died with uh, when Justin Buff Justin Dustin Bufflin retired. His brother. <laughs> Justin, brother Justin. The brother Justin is actually skinny as hell, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's jump forward here to a question from Joseph Barry. He says, do you think that Detroit should try to acquire Dan Vladar from Calgary? Obviously, Detroit's going to have a uh, backup or a 1B goalie need behind Huso uh, if they don't go back to Ned or Helberg. So Dan Vladar, uh, two years at $2.2 $2 million. He fits the bill of, hey, he would be an adequate backup who could play 30 games to, you know, ease Huso's workload. The only drawback I have on Vladar is 
you'd have to give up an asset to get him in trade, and there's probably going to be very similar goalies in free agency who will cost roughly the same. Like, without even looking at it, I can just assume there's going to be five Dan Vladars in free agency. I agree. Frank the Tank says, Hey, guys, curious what your thoughts are about trading 17 for 11 with Vancouver in exchange for taking back a bad contract. Is there an ideal candidate you target on the Canucks, and would OEL be the only non-option given his terrible cap and length? Well, outside of OEL, how many like of their contracts are actual train wrecks so that they would pay to unload? I have heard that they're trying to unload Garland. Yeah, but he teams are still going to view him positively. Well, right? it's, like it's not about how teams view him. It's how they view Vancouver's leverage, and they have none. Yeah, but then the option is they just don't trade him, right? Like, he's not a bad player. His cap hit's not unreasonable for what he provides. It's just long, and, and they have so many cap problems that they have to move contracts, but just because they have to move contracts doesn't mean they're automatically going to take zero return for them. I'm going to be like a, I'm not at all thinking about the value return here, but can you see a world where Vancouver says yes to Besser and 11 uh, for 17 and like one of the second round picks? I can see that. You I would do that, that in a heartbeat, right? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Because Besser makes 6.65 for two more years and they were already looking to move him. And the price... Right, so you get Besser... 11 and all it takes you is 17 and one of the second round picks. Yeah. Oh, you would, God, you, yeah. you would have got Besser. Like, let's just say it was 41st overall for Besser straight up. Uh, at the deadline, that would have been considered a massive overpay for Besser. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And so, so I could see a world where they could think, you know, they have to give up an asset, which effectively they are by moving down in the draft for Besser or Garland. Uh, both players who I'd be happy to for Detroit to bring on. Ekman Larson has one, two, three, four more years at 7.26. <laughs> you, such an atrocious contract. Holy you hang shit. up the phone if they even bring it up. Do you do it if they give you uh, Ekman Larson and pick 11? No. No. He, they they're healthy s- scratched him this year. They're so screwed. They are so screwed. Wait, so you get 11 and you just have to take out the contract. Yeah. That's it. Just four more years at seven point two six. Just four <laughs> only more that years. for oh, man. for a below replacement level. Often, oh, we got we got a bunch of those anyway. So what does <laughs> yeah, it matter? But we're paying those guys like eight hundred and fifty thousand. At least he's Swedish. Yeah. All right, and last one here, uh, just for the sake of time and my sleep. Uh, Udalali says, "How often has Detroit lost out on trades thanks to a player's no trade list? Do you think we're moving off those lists this year or next?" Well, there's no way of knowing, but it's not really a mystery that uh, Detroit hasn't been the most popular destination and that's not been since they were losing that actually goes back to a little bit before that if folks remember mike babcock was pretty unpopular in the dressing room and that spread across the league there were players who really didn't like the idea of playing for him so that hurt detroit and free agency and if it was hurting detroit and free agency then you can imagine he was they were on some no trade list for that reason as like for the period of time that they were losing then yeah they're you know, not New York or L.A., so a lot of players aren't going to mark them as a premium location. And if that team is down in the dumps, which Detroit really only started to turn the bend. Mo Sider's first year was like the, the first really optimistic, like the, the Sider Raymond rookie year, maybe a year before that. But oh, no, it was there was no optimism before Sider and Raymond got there. So it would be hard for players to say, yeah, I want to be in that situation, right? Yeah, exactly. It's not a warm market and it's not a winning market. So real tough sell. And I think it's still a tough sell, but they're getting there. Now, once they're good again, the reversal of fortunes is going to be drastic. Like Detroit is an original six team with legacy, with history, with institution. There's the Eisman factor, which has already proven to pay dividends in terms of bringing in free agents uh, and, you know, uh, quelling concerns of some players and trades. When this team is good, hockey is better for it. It's much like what the league thinks of Chicago. It's what much like what the league says about uh, New York. When this team, when the Red Wings are good, hockey is better, and so players will want to go there. So, okay, we're going to wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. We'd like to thank all of you for tuning in. We'll be back with you on our regular scheduled Mon- or <laughs> Sunday. Uh, episode uh, this week so we're not going to screw with your schedules for a little while here Um, although don't hold your breath as we lead up to the draft things are going to get a little crazy 
Thank you all so much for tuning in. If you want to support the show, uh, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. Uh, if you can't or aren't interested in supporting that way, other ways you can do it are uh, give the show a rating and subscribe wherever you tune in. So uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever. Those ratings and reviews really help as well as hitting that subscribe button and tell a friend about the show. We'd like to thank uh, all of our listeners, new and old, all of our patrons, and our name-level supporters on Patreon. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, uh, Wait For It, Icon, We Are Geelong, the greatest team of all, Glenn Brabham, The Hat 123, Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Croner's Left Knee, Admiral Matt S. of the Cheesebag Navy, Babe Landiscog, Bros Before Hostess, Carl Brutana Nanaluski, Chimmy, Chris P., Citizen High Five, Connor Scoby, Cooking with Kosa, Coyote Season Tickets, and Anywhere But Tempe, Dad, Please Come Home, It's Been Five Years, <laughs> Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek N. Stamp, DJ Denton, Give Blood Fight Probert, Hockey Town Matt, Hassan Malkasem, I Miss Cronwall, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Kaylin Wood, Kevin James, King Tone, Marcus, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, R.A., Red 3, Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, That's What I Appreciates About You, Wallman's Elite Dancing D, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, number one Red Guys fan, A.A. Ron, Adam Gowitska, Adam Rose, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, Captain Antonio Gracias of the United Federation of Cheesebags, C.J. Wilkinson, Commander Ben Barron of the Cheesebag Space Force, Connor Leighton, Corey Prita, Darren Fick, Dungeon Master of Puppets, Evans Lost Rangefinder, Evans Lost Rangefinder, Frank Stanley, Gene Sullivan, Grand Rapids Hockey Guy, Griffey Boy, Instructions Unclear, Cheesebag No Longer Fresh, James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Linda Hull, Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, O. Ophelia, Stephen, Tatarsas, The Hodag, The Original Button of Lemon, and The St. Louis Blueth. Thank you all so much. We'll talk to you Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.